Exciting, exciting. We are in the Torah portion, Pekudei, which means what? Accounting. Okay, uh, this is March 16th of 2024, and it's called Pekudei because look at one of the first words here at our opening Torah portion in Exodus 38, 21. It says, these are the accounts of the tabernacle, even the tabernacle of the testimony, that's referring to the ark, as they were rendered according to the commandment of Moses through the service of the Levites by the hand of Itamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. What this is saying is they had a lot of gold come in, a lot of silver come in, a lot of brass, a lot of all kinds of things. And how many of you know you have to be fiscally responsible? This is the Lord's money, it is not their money, and it is made for the house of the Lord. If you remember, they're brought in way too much. Remember, they had to stop from giving. So what did they do with the way too much? Did they pocket it? Did they give it back? Did they go and throw it? And so it's just a matter of, and how do you know, oftentimes people wonder, is that person accountable with all the funds coming in, right? So this is what that is about. And let's look at verse 24. I want you to get a load of this, especially those of you who handle gold and silver to understand what we're talking about. It says, all the gold that was used for the work and all the work of the sanctuary, even the gold of the offering was 29 talents. Do you know a talent equals 70 pounds? So that was 2,000 pounds of gold. How much did that cost? What was tabernacle worth? 2,000 pounds of gold. That's a lot. 730 uh, shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. Man, one talent is 70 pounds. That is amazing. And then look at the next verse, 100 talents of silver. That's 7,000 pounds of silver. Were for the casting for the sockets of the sanctuary, the sockets of the veil, and the 100 sockets for the 100 talents. A talent for a socket, 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, overlaid their capitals, made uh, the fillets for them. The brass of the offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. There was a lot of gold. There was a lot of silver. There was a lot of brass. Okay, well, what was interesting, the story goes, they were accusing Moses of misappropriating funds. And Moses wasn't really happy with this. But here he was accountable. And let's look at Numbers 12, 7. What did God say concerning Moses? He says, my servant Moses isn't that way. He's faithful in all of my house. All right. And, and Moses wasn't really happy. But now let's jump to Luke chapter 6. And look at verse 1 and 2, where Yeshua is speaking to his disciples. And he says, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And so he called him and he said unto him, how is it that I hear this of you? I want you to give an account of your stewardship or you may no longer be a steward. Well, how many of you know, every one of us are going to have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account. That's what this parable was all about, is the fact that every single one of us are going to have to give an account. Look what it goes on to say in Luke 16, verse 10 and 11. He who is faithful in a little bit is also faithful in a whole lot. Whoever is dishonest in a little bit is also dishonest in much. If therefore you've not been faithful in with the unrighteous money, who's going to commit to your trust the true riches? I mean, some people think, well, if I only steal a dollar, that doesn't make mean any difference. Well, guess what? If you steal a dollar, you'd steal a million dollars if you had the chance. You know, uh, God tests all of us. He tests us in the little ways and he tests us in the big ways. How many of you know that? 
I'll, 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 you know, I remember one time uh, I was, I think it was in Safeway, and I went to the ATM machine, and someone forgot one of their $20 bills. It was just sitting in the ATM machine when I went to get my money. I could have went, score! But I didn't. I, I gave it to someone, uh, you know, there, because it's, it's not mine. Does that make sense? And, and so it's like, wow. But then not only was I faithful a little, I was also faithful in much. We have a member, we had a member of our congregation many years ago, and he and I would have conversations, and uh, he said he wanted to change his will and uh, let El Shaddai get all of his, you know, whatever he had when it was all over with. And I said, great, okay, whatever. I, I'm never concerned about the money. That's just not my big deal. But anyway, he kept telling me that, and then he passed away. And so uh, I had, they called me and said I was given the guardianship or whatever to determine some things. Uh, so anyway, uh, he told me about uh, he had some uh, funds in a safe in Spokane. So I drive with my wife all the way out to Spokane. Uh, we get the funds that were there. We bring them back. Uh, we end up putting all the funds in safety deposit boxes in Seattle, okay? Uh, this gentleman had over a million dollars in cash. Wow. He had boxes and boxes and boxes of gold and silver under his bed in his house. All th- he was a hoarder too. He was a hoarder. The place was a complete disaster. And we got this, we rented, uh, Elsa and I put out about $20,000 uh, and we got a big dumpster. We were throwing a bunch of stuff out but we could only do that while he was alive. He had suffered a bad stroke. He's in the hospital. He died, so we had to stop, so we stopped. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, we had over a million dollars in gold and silver and cash of his that we had retrieved from everywhere and put in a bank in Seattle, uh, and we had been looking for the will. He had forgot to change the will. And so it went to three different places, okay? Now, I very well could have kept a bunch of that silver and gold and given everything and said, well, here's what we found. But I didn't. I did not keep one flipping dime. We gave, even though he had told me he wanted to change it and it's all El Shaddai's, wow, I could have kept a bunch for El Shaddai. I could have kept a bunch for myself. I, you know, give them, say, well, this is all there is and there's nothing they could say. But it's not mine. And so God wants us to be faithful in every area. You know, it, what was really frustrating to me is we submitted our claim for like $20,000 all the expenses and they refused to give it to us. So we were even out a bunch of money as well, even though we were being totally honest and ethical. But hey, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's all for the Lord. You know, and so I don't worry about finances. I told God when I started this thing, hey, you're the one that asked me to start this. I didn't start this. It's up to you to finance it, you know. But anyway, we have to be faithful in little things. Then we'll also be faithful in the big things. Look at Romans 14, 12. Each one of us are going to do what? We're we're all going to stand before God and give an account. Well, uh, oh, here I have, let me go back. Yeah. Okay, so we're all going to have to give an account. Look at Matthew 25, verse 14 and 15. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who's going into another country who called his own servants, which is what believers are supposed to be, and entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. Now we see talents here is not our version of how talented are you. It refers to he gave one person 70 pounds of gold. You know, uh, he gave all this funds, but he only did it. He was fair. He made sure everyone got the amount that they were capable of handling, okay? They all got different amounts. That might not seem fair, but he gave it according to their ability, which is, so it is fair. And then he goes on his journey. Okay, well, look at Matthew 25, 18 and 19. He that received only one, what did he do? He went and dug in the earth. He hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came to reckon with him. And then in verse 24 through 30, it says, he that had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were what? 
a hard man. The whole problem is the relationship with God. And that's the problem many of us have today with God. I know when I was growing up as a Catholic, I saw God as Thor throwing lightning bolts at the people down below. He was just a mean, mean, holding us all accountable, you know. But that all comes down to our attitude. It really does. And he says, I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the earth. There, take it back, it's yours. And the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew I reap where I don't sow, and I gather where I haven't sown. Therefore, you should have at least given my money to the bankers, that at my coming, I should at least receive my own money with interest. Take, therefore, that talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten talents, and to everyone that has shall be given. And he will have abundance, but from him that does have not shall be taken away even that which he seems to have. And then it says, cast that unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so, wow, God gives all of us. He sows finances into us. And how, what do we do with the finances? Do we try to build his kingdom and make it more profitable? Or do we just waste it? Well, I'm going to tell you what we're going to have to give ourselves accountable for. Number one, we are going to be accountable for our time. Look at Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Look, therefore, carefully how you walk, not as someone who's unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. How much more so at this time in our life when you know that the curtain is about to fall, we are going to be accountable for how we spend our time. We really are. I mean, our, how we spend it. Do we spend it watching TV? You know, what do we do with our time? At least read the Bible. You know, I mean, everyone should be reading the, through the Bible uh, in a year. We all should be doing that. Because uh, time tells us where our priorities are. How we spend our time tells us what our priorities are. And then look at this. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. I tell you on that day of judgment, people will give what? An account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Wow, 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 wow. Do you know every word we say is recorded? Whether we know it or not, every word we say is recorded. And when we go before God, He's going to play the recording <laughs> and we're going to have to hear our own words and give an account why we spoke those words. I have here not only, uh, here's speech, blah, 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 blah. But also you're going to see we have to give account of our money, our time, our money, our speech. Let's look at this. Second Corinthians 5, 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah that everyone can receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it's good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade people, but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Every single one of us are gonna appear before the judgment seat of Christ and he's either gonna give us rewards or punishment, but we're all gonna appear before him. Get that in, in our heads. We're all someday going to stand before the Messiah, whether it's just him and us or the whole world watching at that time. I'm, I don't know. But I do know it also says in Corinthians that, uh, well, here it is. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that's a Messiah, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, Every single one of your work will be made manifest for the day will declare it because it's revealed by fire and the fire will try everyone's work of what sort it is. And if anyone's work abide, which he's built upon, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work will be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself shall still be saved, but as by fire. Think of it this way. We're building a house, let's say, right? Are we building it out of wood, hay, and stubble? Or are we building out of gold and silver and precious stones? God's going to take all of our works and he's going to stick it in the fire 
And just like uh, someone whose house is on fire and they get out and they're saved, but everything else got burnt, that's what it's gonna be. We're gonna be there, we have a house, and God's gonna set it on fire, and then when it's done, that's your reward. God said, okay, great, I know you did good things, I know you did bad things, but let's see how it is, and he's gonna stick it in a fire, and you and him are gonna stand there watching your house burn, and he says, your reward is whatever's left. <laughs> You're still saved. You got saved out of the burning house. You're still saved, but for eternity, this is what your reward is going to be. Oops. <laughs> How many of you have ever had your house burned down? Anybody? There's always people here. I know my sister had her house burned down about five, six years ago. You know, all the family was saved, but everything was burnt. You try to look through the ashes and find some things. Well, guess what? We are building spiritual houses. That's what we're, right now, you don't, may not realize it, but every day you are laboring on building your house that's gonna be around for eternity. Do you want a nice house? Or do you not want to want a nice house? What you're doing today, this is what many Christians don't understand. We're not saved by works. I know, neither were the Jews. We do the work because we're building a house. So that's what we have to grasp, all right. Now, 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If someone therefore purges himself of these, he'll be a vessel to honor, sanctified and ready for the master's use and prepared to every good work. So guess what? In God's house is going to be vessels of gold and vessels of earth. What kind of a vessel do we want to be? How do we want to be used? Look at Exodus 12, 1 and 2. The Lord spoke unto Moses and to Aaron. Now, look at this. This is where? In the land of Egypt. And he's saying, this month will be unto you the beginning of months. It'll be the first month of the year to you. So we see the very first commandment given to Israel was to get on God's calendar. Number one, just like I said before, if you plan on getting married to someone, you have to agree on the day. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. God is entering a marriage covenant with Israel, and he said, you have to do it with me uh, on the spiritual calendar. You don't do it on an earthly calendar. Exodus 40, verse 1 through 3. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, on the first day of the first month, you are to set up the tabernacle. Okay? So back in Egypt, you know, he says, look, the first day of the first month is what I want to reckon. Look at the new moon. And then two weeks later was the Passover and judgment and they escaped. And now a year later, he says, on the anniversary of that day, when I told you the calendar was to begin, it is on that specific day on the first of Nisan that we're gonna set up the tabernacle and I'm going to come and dwell in your presence. And here's the key, look at Exodus 40, verse 16. That's Moses did according to all that the Lord commanded. Exodus 40, verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Now, how many of you know when it says the first day of the first month, that was not January? What is he talking about? He's talking about Nisan 1, which is the very day of the eclipse coming on April 8th this year. This April 8th is the very anniversary of Moses' tabernacle being set up and God's glory falling, and that's the day of the total solar eclipse. We have to understand how important this date is. And look at verse 19. He spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, put the covering of the tent above on it, as the Lord commanded. Verse 21, he brought the ark into the tabernacle. He set up the veil of the covering and he covered the ark of the testimony. How? As the Lord commanded. And then verse 23, then he set the bread in order on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded. And verse 25, he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord. Are we getting a hint here? Okay. He didn't do it based on how he felt. He didn't do it based on when he thought would be a good time. He did everything as the Lord 
commanded. Now look at verse 34 and 35. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses wasn't even able to enter into the tent because the cloud stayed there on and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Wow. Well, next week, here Moses couldn't even enter. So next week we begin with the Lord calling out to Moses saying, okay, here's how you can enter. The glory stayed, but... Moses had to follow protocol in order to enter. Just like if uh, you're an astronaut and you're going to go into space, you better have on a spacesuit. Okay? You, you have to be ready and equipped. And so you have to have on the right garments. You have to have on the right everything so you can enter. Because if we remember, that's the very same day Nadab and Abihu died. All right, now... Think about this. At the conclusion of creation in Genesis, God created the Garden of Eden, and it was a space created specifically for humans. And so it was a shared space, a place for humanity and God. But man's rebellion tarred the place, ruined the place. Now, this time, man is given the opportunity of creating a, spared, a shared space for them and God. So God created a shared space for him and us. We contaminated it. And now we're building a shared space for God and us. We're given the opportunity of recreating in one sense, the garden of Eden for God. The tabernacle is the new garden of Eden and man is to be willing, the willing creator of this sacred space. Wow. God gives us the opportunity to create a place for him in the exodus but guess what we have to follow protocol he will not live in an unclean place so we're we're required to create a place for him now here's something else that's kind of scary and it goes back to free will did you know god's presence in the garden of eden did not prevent adam from rebelling god was there in the garden of eden that didn't prevent mankind from rebelling. God's presence was in Solomon's temple and it did not prevent Solomon or Israel from rebelling. God's presence on earth during the millennial reign, remember he's gonna rule here for a thousand years, that doesn't prevent mankind from rebelling. And at the end, the, Gog, the final Gog Magog war happens. God's presence among us does not keep us from rebelling. Some people think, well, if God was here, just like if the, I'm not going to speed if, the, the, if I see the police officer, okay? Well, guess what? God's presence is going to be here and people are still going to want to rebel. Some people think, you know, that, well, uh, I may be a sinner, but when I die and go to heaven, I'm still going to go to heaven if I, even if I don't accept Jesus, let's say, okay? Well, guess what? You're going to rebel in God's presence. And God doesn't want that. So, <clears throat> get a load of this. How many know there's a 7,000 year time frame plan in God, right? 7,000 years, seven days he rested. The 7,000th year is the millennial day, a thousand years of rest. But you know what that millennial reign is about? I believe it's so that we can learn from history before the new heavens and the new earth come. After that 7,000th year, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and God is going to start over. But God must have a deterrence for our wrong choices. God, through both his justice and his mercy, will not allow people with a free will to just rebel after the new heavens and the new earth. People think, well, during the, millennia, or during the new heavens and the new earth, I'll never sin. No, the possibility will always, always be there. It was possible when Satan fell before earth was created to sin in God's presence. It was possible when God's presence was there with Adam. It was possible when God's presence was there with Israel. He's not going to take away our free will. He doesn't want a bunch of AI robot. He doesn't want that. 
So we always have to be free to choose, even in the new heavens and the new earth. And so what is he going to do to help deter us is found in Isaiah 66, verse 22 through 24. He says, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make is going to remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it'll come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh is going to come and worship before me, says the Lord, and they're going to go forth and they're going to look upon all the carcasses of those people that have transgressed against me, where their worm will not die, neither will their fire be quenched, and they'll be abhorring to all flesh. So every week, every month, we get to look into hell. That is going to be God's deterrence from us. Oh, don't want to do that. He has to have a deterrence, but he also has to let us have a free will. And so this is going to be the deterrence. We all are going to be accountable. But King Solomon <clears throat> was not accountable. Look at 1 Kings 11, 5 through 8. It says Solomon went after, the Hebrew says he chased after. They didn't go after him. He chased after them. Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. He didn't fully follow after the Lord as did David his father. And then Solomon built high places for Chemosh, the abomination of of Moab, and where did he build it? On the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives. And he built it for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all of his strange wives, of which he had over a thousand, and burnt incense and sacrificed to their gods. Okay, oops. Here is Molech. Molech was the one that the mothers would give their firstborn to. This was child sacrifice. Solomon is the one who instituted child sacrifice and he offered his firstborn son to Molech. Most people don't realize it, but right there it is telling you. He said, and guess what? He married an Ammonite. That's who, Rehoboam, his mom was an Ammonite. And this was her God. So, you know, this is amazing that Rehoboam must not have been his firstborn. Rehoboam must have been his secondborn because the firstborn was slaughtered to Molech. He wasn't accountable. As a matter of fact, look at 1 Kings 11, 9 through 11. The Lord was what? Angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who appeared to him twice. It's, it's one thing for a judge who not only is supposed to know the law, but honor the law, breaks the law, okay? Well, Solomon, it's, it's one thing for us if we sin, but we're accountable based on how much we know. God literally appeared to Solomon twice, telling him to quit it. And Solomon thumbed his nose at God and said no. Can you imagine how much more accountable you are if God literally appeared to you and told you to quit it and you said no? That is Solomon. He wasn't as bright as you thought he was. And that's why God said, the Lord said to Solomon, as much as this is done by you and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely rend the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Now look at Leviticus 20, verse 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, <clears throat> saying, Again, I want you to say to the children of Israel, Whoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers even, that sojourn in Israel, that gives any of his seed to Molech, he will be put to death. And the people of the land will stone him with stones. Do you realize the priest, first off, he married a strange woman, an Ammonite. And it doesn't matter if she offered her child to Molech, or Solomon did, both of them were to be stoned. But because he's a politician, everyone thinks he's above the law. And the politician thinks he's above the law. Solomon should have been stoned, guys. Look at Leviticus 24 and 5. 
This is even powerful. It says, and if the people of the land, you know, who honor the politician who breaks the law, if they in any way hide their eyes from the one who gives his seat to Molech and they don't kill him, God says, I'm going to set my face against them and against their family and cut them off and all that go whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And that's why for 400 years, they offered their own children to Molech. If it's good enough for Solomon, it's good enough for us. Wow. Everyone was turning their eye from what Solomon was doing. And then look at this. At, here's the temple dedication ceremony. I know I talked a little bit about Solomon last week, but I'm going to add some things. This is the dedication of Solomon's temple. That's the altar. And look at 1 Kings 8, 63 and 64. Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. Look at what he's offering. 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. And so the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord the same day the king hallowed the middle of the court. The king can't hallow anything. The priests are the ones who's supposed to hallow something. But you, this is going to blow you away. For there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of peace offerings because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too insignificant to receive his burnt offerings. This is, it's like the bride. It's someone trying to outshine the bride at their wedding. The bride was God's temple. And Solomon is saying, that little altar isn't big enough for my offerings. And look what I'm offering. I'm offering these hundreds and hundreds of thousands, but that's too insignificant. So I have to sanctify this big area to do all the sacrifices here. The Hebrew word is katan, which means too little. It's too insignificant. So here, even during the dedication ceremony, it says it was too little. And that means it was too insignificant for the great offerings of Solomon. Look at his attitude. It's all about me. He was the biggest narcissist in the world. Solomon was. Look at Genesis 1, 2 through 4. Let me see where I'm at. Yep, we're wrapping this up here. At the end of every book, and specifically at the end of uh, this book, we always say, Kazak, Kazak, Venit, Kazak, right? Okay. But I want to show you this. Look at Genesis. One, two through four. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be what? Light. And there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Well, look at this Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of your words brings what? Light. The moment he opened his mouth, God opened his mouth, there was light. He just said, be light. His words, light. Well, guess what? We are accountable for our words. And coming to accountability, we have to have, make sure our words bring light. Our words shouldn't bring darkness. Our words should be dividing light from darkness. We live in dark times. Our job right now is to bring light into that darkness so people can properly see. With that said, let's stand. And we'll say this and then I'll pray. Everyone, together. Kazak, Kazak, Vendit, Kazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Avinu Malkenu, our Father King. Right now, I can't help but think of after. At the very end of Moses' life, you told him to be strong. And then both you and Moses told Joshua to be strong. And as they were about to enter the promised land, and here we are, we're about to enter the millennial reign. And I know that you are speaking to each and every one of us that now is the time for us to be strong. And we also need to realize as we're being strong, we need to realize internally we are going to be accountable for our 
time, for our speech, for our finances. And so, Lord, I want to thank you right now for those who aren't narcissistic and only think about them, but they're thinking about building your kingdom. And we thank you so much for all of those here around the United States and around the world who realize the times that we're in and want to commit themselves to building your kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, we're going to go digging deeper into the Gospels because how many of you like authenticity? Yes. How many of you would like something that is a fake? Let's say you paid a thousand dollars for some watch to find out it was a fake. Who would be happy if they bought a Rolex that was a ten thousand dollar Rolex for a hundred bucks? You thought you made a good deal, and then you realize you just wasted your money on a fake. Yeah. Boo hiss. Okay, well. Let me start with this. I have three verses I added to your notes. They're all at the very beginning here. So just, you all know the verses, but you can just write the reference down. As you know, we're digging deeper into the gospels. So I'm gonna bring some things in the, from the gospels into a new light you've never seen before. Some of you have, if you've been around with us. But in Luke 22:15, Yeshua was saying with a great desire, I desire to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. So what's the time frame? When is this happening? Passover. Yay. Now look at the next few verses. Verse 19 of Luke 22. It says, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When he said, do this in remembrance of me, what was he talking about? The Passover. So often Christians call it the Last Supper, but that could be the Last Supper before someone's being executed. This Last Supper, forget about saying the Last Supper. Yes, it was his Last Supper before he died, but it was the Passover Seder. And the Passover Seder is always done on Nisan 14, going into Nisan 15, which is the first day of unleavened bread, which is a Sabbath, even if it falls during the middle of the week. And Yeshua said, I want you to do this. What is the this? But what, 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 is, what does he want them to remember? He says, do this. He's referring to what? <laughs> no. He says, the this is Passover. It's, I want you to do the pass When you do the Passover Seder, do this in remembrance of me. My point is, he wasn't talking about communion. He's talking about the Passover Seder. He says, I want you to do this. So every Passover, when I, the day of my death, I want you to always honor the day of my death, which is what day? Nisan 14. So he says, every Nisan 14, I want, when you do the Passover, I want you to do it in remembrance of me and the new covenant, right? Okay, now look at 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. Rabbi Shaul, or Apostle Paul, is commenting about that day. And he says, and when the Lord had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And what was the this? Passover Seder. Okay, not just Last Supper. And then it says, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had eaten and he said, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So the, this is the Passover and the Passover has a fixed date of what date? Nisan 14. Okay, so it was more than a last supper. Christians like to call it the last supper because they don't want to equate it to Nisan 14. They don't want to keep the Passover because that's Jewish. So they call it the Last Supper. Now, let me ask you something. Let's say your birthday is April 25th, okay? And you get married and your spouse says, well, I really like the month of November, so let's keep your birthday on November 1st. 
And you know, I've been celebrating my birthday when I was born every April 25th for my whole life. And now you're telling me that you want to celebrate my birthday in November? Does that work? How about your anniversary? Let's say your anniversary is on July 1st, but they say, no, we're going to celebrate your anniversary in November. Does that work? All right. I'm glad you understand. Okay. Now let's look at this. Now we'll go to your notes. In John 18, 39, Pilate says, you guys have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And what did they say? No. Who did they want released? Do you remember his name? And what does Barabbas mean? Bar is son of the father. His name was son of the father. And that's who they wanted released now. Okay. And now look at this one. John 19, 26 and 27. And when Yeshua saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to John, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Okay. So what happened? John took Miriam into his own home. And when persecution came, they both moved to Ephesus. That's where they moved to. Now, again, let's stop for a minute and let, let's look at Leviticus 8, or Leviticus 23, verse 5 and 6. Let's look at what the command was. On the 14th day of the first, which is in January, at even is the does it say the Jewish Passover? Passover? It's the Lord's Passover. The 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days, you have to eat unleavened bread. So the name of the first month is Nisan. And look at this in Exodus 12, 1 and 2. The Lord told Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month is to be unto you the beginning of the month. It will be the first month of the year to you. Okay. The new month always began with the new moon. The middle of the month was always the full moon. And Passover is at the full moon. Tabernacles is at the full moon. Rosh Hashanah is at the new moon. Okay, so Passover has to be on the full moon, right? Because the Hebrew word for moon is also the Hebrew word for throne. And God's throne is being set at the full moon because it says in uh, Zechariah, when he returns, he returns at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the full moon. That's when he sits on his throne and all nations have to come up at the full moon to worship him as king. And that's why we read in Isaiah, when there's a new heaven and a new earth, everyone still has to keep the new moon. The new moon is important to God. All right. Now, how many of you ever heard of Herod Agrippa? There were many Herods. Okay. Herod Agrippa was around 41 to 44, okay? And he was appointed by Claudius, the emperor, the Roman emperor Claudius Caesar in 41. He was very popular figure among all the Jews. Herod Agrippa was. But look at Acts 12, one through three. It says, at that time, Herod Agrippa, the king, he laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. Also, this was during the days of unleavened bread. This is at Passover. And then in Acts 12, 4, it says, when he apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after what? Easter? It's not Easter. Hello. Well, let's take a look at this. Let me show you something. Okay, this is from Danny Ben Gigi's scholarly master, where what it has on this uh, software that Danny has, we see there's English. This is the New Testament. It's there's English, there's Greek, and there's Hebrew all in one. You can read them. Now, I want you to see this. This is John 18:39. You have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Remember, we just got done reading that. Now, here it is in the 
Greek, transliterated and in Greek. And if you know, in Greek, it's called Pascha. You see that? And you can see the Pascha right here. That's Pascha. Pascha is translated as what? Passover. And it comes from the Hebrew word Pesach. So here's Pesach. And right here is Pesach, the P, the Pe, the Samek, and the Chet. Pe, uh, the bait has, has to do with in Passover or at Passover. Okay, so does everyone understand the Hebrew came first, and Hebrew word is Pesach, Pesach. From that, the Greek got Pascha, Pascha, and in English, we have the Paschal Lamb, right? Okay, now, here we go. Acts 12, 4, here is the Hebrew, the Passover, ha Pesach, ha Pesach. Here is the Greek, Pascha, Pascha. But how do the translators translate it as Easter? How come they translate Pascha as Passover in one verse, but it becomes Easter in another verse? <sighs> Hello. There, that's what I'm telling you. This is what Danny and I are creating this new Bible program for. We're going to be correcting all of the errors in the New Testament, the Hebrew, the Greek, the English. Now, how many of you know, I think as this coming Tuesday is spring. Yay. Hello, spring. Well, how do we know that March 19th, it's either 19th, 20th or 21st, depending on how things go scientifically. But this Tuesday, March 19th is spring. Now, I want to explain to you the equinox. Okay, here we go. This is the spring equinox, and it happens when the earth is totally perpendicular. And then in summer, it's at an angle. Okay? So, uh, the sun mostly shines on us, the northern hemisphere. Okay, the spring equinox, it's like that. And uh, the earth tilts. But I wanted you to understand. Now, when did this become Easter? A lot of people think it was Constantine in the year 300s. Wrong. It happened much, 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 much earlier. And I'm going to explain this to you. Now, first off, here we go. Okay, this is this year. This is March. Right now, we are doing a Parsha, Parsha Pakude. Okay, so here we are on the March calendar. Everyone see that? All right, well... The new moon was right here, Rosh Kodesh Adar. This is the, okay, Rosh Kodesh. And so we are a week after the new moon. Now, here is Purim, and Purim is Adar 15, which is a what? Full moon, because it's the middle of the month, right? Now, right here is spring. This coming Tuesday is spring. Here's the problem. Right down there, March 31st, is Easter with the Easter Bunny. Oh, that reminds me, I don't have this picture. I was in Elam Club the other day, and there's this big Nazarene church. Maybe I did put it in. Let me see if I did. Oh, I forgot. But anyway, the big sign in front of the church is the Easter Bunny with Easter eggs. That, that's what their focus is, the Easter Bunny and Easter eggs. And now, since that's Easter... They are saying, Christians are celebrating this as the day of the resurrection. Okay? All right. <laughs> yes, they're celebrating the resurrection a month before he dies. All right. I don't know how you do that, but that happens many times. Okay. So if that is Easter, do you see this here? This is Adar 29. What day is he supposed to die? Nisan 14. On the full moon. But now Good Friday is here, nowhere near the full moon, a month before Passover. It's the second Adar of 19. It's the 13th month of the year. And so he's supposed to die on the full moon. They not only have the full moon wrong, they have Adar 19 wrong. It's... They wanted to be totally disconnected from Judaism. I mean, God says, do this, which is Passover, which is Nisan 14. I want everyone to celebrate the resurrection, but I wanted them to celebrate it when it happened. 
Just like your anniversary. Do you want your anniversary celebrated three months later? Do you want your birthday celebrated two months earlier? No. And God has a calendar. He says, this is when. But the thing is this, they wanted nothing to do with Judaism. Therefore, they, had, they didn't know how to figure out when Nisan 14 was. They were dependent on the Jews. So they said, forget that. Here's what they said. The Bible says it's supposed to be in the spring. Therefore, we're just going to do it the first Sunday after the spring equinox. That's what they decided. So here's the spring equinox. And Easter is uh, always going to be celebrated uh, right here. It's, let me see. Yeah, he would have died here. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. They do it based on the spring equinox, not on the Bible. Okay, so now, let me see. Okay, John moves to Ephesus. He cares for Miriam, Yeshua's brother. Now, I want you to take a look at this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 22. This is the second epistle to Timothy, who was ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. And it was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. Okay, the apostle Paul is the one who appointed Timothy as the first bishop of the Ephesians. Now, I need to explain. Okay, I'm gonna show you this. You gotta know history. Okay, this was Caesar Augustus who was in charge even before Yeshua was born. And after him came Tiberius. And you can see he was from the year 14 to the year 37. So Yeshua, this is the one that he mostly knew. Then there was Caligula from the year 37 to 41. He only served about three years. And all these people are related to each other. They're all kids, nephews, this kind of a thing. Okay, and then came Claudius Caesar from 41 to 54. And here comes Nero. And uh, this is where Peter dies in 64 AD. And Nero ruled from 54 to 68. And if you'll notice here, uh, one was the grand nephew. The next one is the stepson, another grand nephew, uncle, grand nephew. I mean, they're all related. And Nero is uh, right before the destruction of the temple. He ruled till 68. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, let's go over here. After him came Vespasian, who was, these were both Vespasian's sons. So after Vespasian came Titus. After Titus came Domitian. Okay, he ruled till 79 He ruled from 79 to 81, and him from 81 to 96. Has everyone got that? Okay. In the year 88, he was ruling Domitian from 81 to 96. He ruled about 15 years. This is when, in the year 88, Clement became the bishop of Rome. He's one of the first popes, according to the Catholic. He didn't claim to be uh, the Pope. He was, a, he was a, a good guy. There's nothing wrong with Clement, but he, they were all called bishops or overseers. Clement is mentioned in the Bible. Google or go to your Bible, look up Clement. He's mentioned in the Bible who lived during that time. Now, in year 95, Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, which is right on the coast where John's seven letters to the churches in Revelation, that's one of them. Who has never heard of Polycarp? Anybody never heard of Polycarp? Everyone's heard of Polycarp? No? Okay. Well, this is important. I want you to see this. Okay. We just got done mentioning Domitian. Uh, Domitian was the Roman emperor from 81 to 96. Then came Nerva, and he has the nerve to murder Domitian. And then after him comes Trajan, who was Nerva's adopted son. But now, that's the Roman emperors. Let's look at the different bishops. The bis- uh, it was Domitian who exiled John to Patmos in 95 when John writes the book of Revelation. 
And then when he's being exiled, he appoints Polycarp, who's only 26 years old, to be the bishop of Smyrna. Now, Polycarp was born a year before the temple was destroyed. And so he's about 26 uh, years old when he becomes the bishop of Smyrna. And he stays the bishop from 26 to 86 years old. And so here, Polycarp is someone who knows John personally. John discipled him. John and him are good friends, all right? So here is Polycarp as a bishop of Smyrna, but there's a new bishop uh, in Rome. <clears throat> but I want you to see, after he murders Domitian, he sets John free. So John was only on Patmos for one year. And then what does he do? He returns to Ephesus, and that's where he pins the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The bishop of Rome, as I said, was Clement from 88 to 97. So both these are good guys. They both know each other, okay? But let's watch what happens. Okay, that's Clement, how the artist drew him. Okay, <clears throat> after Clement in 97 comes the next bishop of Rome, whose name is Avaristus. There's Avaristus. Okay. Now I want you to see, here is Turkey. And we were just there this last year, many of us. We went to all seven churches. Uh, Smyrna, the bishop is Polycarp. And a few years later, Polycrate becomes the bishop of Ephesus. There's also this gentleman named Irenaeus, who was a Greek who converted, okay? He was born in Smyrna in 130 AD or CE. So Polycarp trained Irenaeus. I don't know how much you know about the early fathers, but here is the thing. Right here is the wall between the West and the East. And John pins his letter in Revelation to the seven assemblies in Asia. The problem was in Rome, they were saying to all the Jewish people, you ain't the boss of me. And so they wanted to do their own thing in the West. And if you realize there was no letter addressing any church in the West, let alone one in Rome, in the book of Revelations. Uh, let me go here. So now comes Hadrian in 117 to 138 AD or CE, however you want to say it. After him comes Antonius Pius. After him, Marcus Aurelius and then Commodus. Well, these are the different bishops of Rome during these time frames. Now, I'm going to give you a verse that will blow most of you away. Let me just see, I got Trajan, he's coming up. Okay, we're after that. Did you know, and I can prove to you, that the apostle John, whom Jesus loved, was kicked out of the church. Not only was the apostle John kicked out of the church, so were all the Jews. Not only were the Jews kicked out of the church, so was all the Gentiles that wanted the Jews in were kicked out of the church. And do you know it's in every one of your Bibles? And everybody misses it? Look at your notes. In, oh, I think I added this one, sorry. But write this down, write it down. Third John, chapter one. There's only one chapter. But in chapter one, verse nine and 10. Now, get a load of this. When did I say John wrote the book of Revelation and when did he write the gospels? It was in 90 AD. Okay, it was long, 20 years after the temple was down. So when Jesus died in 30, it's been 60 years. It's been 60 years since the Messiah died. But because of the destruction of the temple, the scattering of the Jews, the new Gentiles who have come in are taking over the synagogues and they want to be the boss. The problem is all they know is Plato, Socrates. They don't know Torah. They don't know Hebrew. They can find a Greek version of the Bible because it was written in Greek for the Greek speaking Jews. So they are looking at the Greek Bible and they're saying we're now the boss and they're kicking all the Jews out. 
Look at 1 John. Oh, well, you can look at it or listen. Here it goes. The Apostle John. How many of you would like the Apostle John in your church? Hello. John said, I wrote. No, let me ask you this. If I said my name was Paco, where am I from? If I said my name was Igor. Okay. If I said Diotrephes. Greek. It means lover of Zeus. That's what his name means. Lover of Zeus is what Diotrephes means. Okay, and I don't have this verse either, but you'll all remember this verse in the Gospels. Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles who want to lord over the flock. You need to be a servant, right? So here is a Gentile who wants to lord over the flock. And listen to what it says. John says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among everyone, does not receive us. There it is. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does. And he even prates against us with malicious words. And not being content with that, he himself doesn't even receive the brethren. That's the other Jews. He doesn't receive the 12 disciples. He doesn't receive the other Jews. And he forbids those who will, and he kicks them out of the church. That is in every Bible, in 3 John 1, 9, that it was already happening that the Jews were being kicked out. Yeah, verse 9 and 10. There's only one chapter. Yeah, verse 9 and 10. Now, I want you to notice that, that how close Ephesus and Smyrna were. They're next door neighbors, okay? Uh, Smyrna was only 35 miles from Ephesus, not far, like Tacoma to Seattle. That's about how far they were apart. Well, here's the thing about ancient Smyrna. It was very involved in emperor worship. And John is the one who appointed Polycarp to be the bishop of Smyrna. Now, as I said, Polycarp was born in 69, a year before the temple was destroyed. And he was martyred on February 23rd of the year 155. He was 86 years old when he was martyred. Now, written about 156, within a year after the event that he died, there were authentic eyewitness reports of how he was martyred, okay, um, by the Christians of Smyrna. And he, they wrote up a letter and had it circulated to all the uh, assemblies. So let's go here for a minute. Here is Polycarp. And like I said, he was the bishop from 95 to 155. Who were the Roman bishops, which they call popes, but they weren't popes, they were bishops. You have uh, Telesphorus from there to there, and then Pius, and then Anicetus. And notice these overlap, Pius and Anicetus. It was in that year that there was the difference. And uh, Polycarp, Okay, who's like a hundred and uh, is like eighty six years old here? Okay, he is arguing with the Roman popes. Now Polycarp knew John personally, and he is the one who appointed Polycrate to be the bishop of Ephesus, and he was bishop for forty six years, from one hundred and fifty to one hundred and ninety six. And Polycrate was trained by Polycarp, who was trained by the apostle John. Okay, now, it was clear back then in the year 100, not during the time of Constantine, that Polycarp is telling everyone we have to keep the Passover. But Pius was saying, or Anicetus was saying, no, we're going to keep the day of the resurrection. And then there was this big argument, and then later, Polycrate in the year 195 has the same thing. Victor was wanting to support Easter and he was saying, no, the Bible says we're supposed to keep the Passover. Oh, here's where I put it. So here we go. This is the Enumclaw Church of the Nazarene and they're having a big Easter extravaganza with bunny and eggs. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Okay, but now follow me here. This is what's amazing. Let me go back to this. All right. There was a controversy 
between Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, and Anicetus. Okay, you see Anicetus here? Right before this last year, they're having an argument over the bishop of Rome over dating of Passover versus Easter. And Polycarp defended keeping the Passover against the Roman bishop Anicetus, whose desire was to see the Passover replaced by a different festival. And so Polycarp remained faithful to Nisan 14, adamant that the apostle John taught him this truth about Passover observance. And let me see. Then, of course, Victor, you can see the Pope Victor during Marcus Aurelius. And listen to this. They also had a big fight discussion uh, over all of this. And listen to this. <clears throat> In anger, guess what the Bishop of Rome does? He thinks he's the boss. He excommunicates Polycrate and all those who shared his verse, view. So in other words, all of Turkey, all of the churches that John wrote to evidently because the Roman Bishop decided to, they excommunicated them all, all right? And <clears throat> uh, all of the parishes of Asia though, Turkey, all of them remained faithful to the biblical calendar saying the 14th day of the month of which the Jews co were commanded to sacrifice their lambs should be observed as the feast of the Savior's death. To their credit, all the bishops of Asia, led by Polycrates, stood their ground and were not about to compromise on this truth. Polycrates insisted we need to obey God rather than man or their traditions. And so it was time to write a letter to Victor. And this is how his letter began. We observe the exact day, Nisan 14 for Passover. We don't add, we don't take away. Uh, and he says uh, to the Pope, the Passover date can't be changed by humans. But see, what they were doing was changing the resurrection date. They said, you Jews can keep Passover on Nisan 14, but we don't want anything to do with your calendar. Therefore, we're going to create a new calendar and we're just going to celebrate Easter on the, right after the new moon. And here's what Polycrates literally wrote. He's, uh, he didn't write it in English, but this is the translation. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming, when he shall come with glory from heaven and will seek out all of his saints. Unlike some of our preachers today, and now this is me, these men of God knew these saints uh, were all awaiting the resurrection. And despite their defense, Bishop Victor excommunicated Polycrates and everyone else. But guess what? Irenaeus, who was a Gentile, who was the bishop in France, spoke to Victor and they decided not to excommunicate them. Now, how many of you have heard the how the martyrdom of Polycarp took place. Anyone heard how Polycarp? Now, how many of you know Polycarp's the good guy? Okay. Here is the story. Tensions were already building throughout the Roman Empire as Christians rejected the gods and the goddesses that everyone else was worshiping. And did you know the pagans were actually calling the Christians atheists? because they believed in all these gods. So the Christians who believed in the one God were considered atheists. I just wanted to get the mindset of what is going on. As Polycarp made clear to the Roman government officials, the real atheists are those who don't worship the one true God. And as the story opens, some of Smyrna's Christians have already been put to death and search parties have been looking for Polycarp, who had been persuaded to do the prudent thing and run. <laughs> Someone has just tipped off the pursuers that Polycarp was hiding out in a farmhouse. I gotta remember, he's 86 years old. And the mounted police set out on a Friday about supper time and they carried their usual weapons as if they were advancing against a bandit. Late in the evening, they arrived to arrest Polycarp and found that he was resting upstairs. 
He could have escaped to another place, but he decided to stay. And he said, oh, God's will be done. I mean, I'm 86 years old. <laughs> okay. When Polycarp heard that the police were there, he went downstairs and talked with them. Everyone was amazed at his age and courage and wondered why there should be so much haste about arresting an 86-year-old man like this. Despite the lateness of the hour, he set a table for them and had them eat and drink as much as they desired. He asked them to give him an hour to pray undisturbed, and they agreed. So Polycarp stood, and he prayed out loud right in front of them. <clears throat> he was so filled with the grace of God that for two hours he prayed, and he could not be silent. And those who listened were astounded, and many were sorry that they'd even come to arrest such a kind old man. When Polycarp had finished his prayer, after remembering everyone who had ever done uh, anything or crossed his path, both small and great, high and low, the time came for him to leave. And so they set him on a donkey to lead him to the city. And they were yelling, save yourself, Polycarp. The chief of police, whose name happened to be Herod, and his father, Nicotas, met Polycarp and took him into their carriage. Sitting beside him, they tried to persuade him to change his mind. What harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and doing a sacrifice and saving yourself from death? At first, Polycarp didn't answer them, but when they kept at it, he said, I'm not going to do what you advise. Then they gave up trying to persuade him and began to make threats. They forced him out of the carriage so fast that he actually scraped his shin getting out and without even turning around as though he had felt nothing, Polycarp walked on quickly and was taken to the noisy stadium. As he entered, <clears throat> a voice from heaven came saying, be strong, Polycarp, and act like a man. No one saw the speaker, but our friends who were there heard a voice. Polycarp was brought before the pro -council. He also tried to persuade him to deny the faith. He said, respect your age, swear by the divine power of Caesar, change your mind, say away with the atheists, referring to the Christians. But Polycarp, with a solemn look at the unruly mob in the stadium, pointed at them, looking up to heaven and says, away with all you atheists. And so the proconsul urged him harder, take the oath and I'll let you go, curse Messiah. Polycarp says, 86 years I've served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And when the proconsul kept insisting, swear by the divine power of Caesar, Polycarp answered, L listen, plainly, I'm a Christian. And if you wish to learn the Christian message and arrange a meeting and give me a hearing, I'd be glad to tell you about it. And so the proconsul said, I have wild animals, and I'll throw you to them unless you change your mind. Polycarp replied, okay, call him in. Scorn the wild beasts and I'll burn you alive if you don't change your mind. Polycarp says, oh, this is heavy. You threaten with fire that burns for but a short time, but is soon quenched. You don't know about the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment that awaits the wicked. But why are you waiting? Come, do whatever you want. And the proconsul was astonished and sent his herald into the middle of the arena three times to announce, Polycarp has declared that he's a Christian. And at the herald's announcement, the whole crowd roared with a wild anger and a loud cry. This is the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches many to stop offering sacrifices to the gods. Shouting out with one voice, they all demanded that Polycarp be burned alive. And the mob hurried together wood and kindling from the shops and the bathhouses. And when the pyre was ready, Polycarp took off his outer clothes. He unfastened his belt and he tried to take off his shoes. Immediately, they began to pile the wood around him. They were going to nail him to the stake as well. But Polycarp said, oh, lead me the way I am. He who gives me power to endure the fire will help me to remain in the flames. I won't run out even without being secured by nails. He then said a prayer. When he had said amen, the men in charge of the fire lit it and the great flame blazed up. <clears throat> we who were given the privilege to witness it saw a great miracle and we have been kept alive so that we might report to others 
what happened. The fire took the shape of a vaulted room like a ship's sail filled with wind and surrounded the body of Polycarp like a wall, but he was standing there. But the wind blew the fire all around him. <clears throat> Seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, the lawless men finally commanded that an executioner go up and stab him with a dagger. Isn't that amazing? This is what is going on. And a lot of this is because of the argument of Easter versus Passover. Well, now, how many of you have heard of the Council of Nicaea? This is in 325. This is the one with Constantine. Okay, now I want you to listen to what Constantine had to say. This is a letter from Constantine. It says, when the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter arose, it was universally thought that it would be more convenient that everyone should keep the feast on one day. Okay, how many of you know that we're not supposed to do anything based on what's convenient? Do we do what's convenient or do we do what God says? Well, they figured it's more convenient if everyone does it instead of having two different... See, Constantine was, okay, Rome and Rome ends up taking over Asia. And so now he's the boss. And he says, we're gonna do what is more convenient. Now, are we supposed to do what the majority says or what God says? Okay. He goes on and he says this, in rejecting the Jewish custom that we can transmit to our descendants the more legitimate mode of celebrating Easter, we ought not therefore to have anything in common with the Jew for the savior has shown us a better way. Our worship following a more legitimate, a more convenient course, the orders of the days of the week, and consequently in unanimously adopting this mode, we desire dearest brethren to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jew. They do not possess the truth in this Easter question for in their blindness, and repugnance to all of our improvements, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We cannot imitate those who are openly in error. Well, wait a minute. Look at Numbers chapter nine, verse nine through 11. The Lord is speaking to Moses and he said, tell the children of Israel, if any one of you or your posterity are unclean by reason of a dead body or in a journey far off, he's to keep the Passover the 14th day of the second month. There's nothing wrong with keeping the Passover the second month. But do the Christians know the Torah? No, they know Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. And so look at this. He says, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We can't imitate those who are openly in error. How then could we follow these Jews who are most certainly blinded by errors for to celebrate a Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. But even if this were not so, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communicating with such wicked people, these Jews, you should consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to demand what our reason approves and we should have nothing in common with the Jews. So are we supposed to go by the majority? Are we supposed to go by human reasoning? Not, none of these things. And so what we have to, uh, let me look at this, realize is we're supposed to do what God says. That's what Polycarp was saying. That's what Polycrate was saying. But see, here is Nicaea. And I was there this last year with a whole bunch of people. And we went over into Greece, right? There's Constantinople, okay? Which is Istanbul, okay? Uh, but they took over Rome. Rome took over this whole area of Asia. And so it was at that council of Nicaea that Rome was asserting their authority uh, over everybody. But now you know this true story of Easter. Ishtar is based after the for God, goddess of fertility, which is why they have a rabbit. And I don't know how a rabbit ever lays eggs. But um, anyway, I just wanted you to see the importance of the calendar. 
Does that make sense, the importance of the calendar? That's what we need to do. Because now they're not celebrating it on the 4th. Easter, again, is the resurrection. But Passover is not for another month. How in the world do you celebrate his resurrection before he even dies? They're on a completely different calendar. It's based totally on the sun. God said it has to be on the sun and the moon. Yes. I, well, they ended up stabbing him. Yeah, yeah. So that's what happened. He was surrounded by fire and he wouldn't die. So they got mad. They came up and they stabbed him. And that's how he died. Yeah. So he was martyred. But that was the whole thing. God was totally with Polycarp. Amen. Let's stand.